Good evening, everybody. It's really, really lovely to see you here. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening and a very warm welcome from me also um, to all those joining us online, which includes um, pupils from our partnership school. So thank you. Uh, this is, of course, um, the first in our new lecture series, Enlightening Minds, uh, which we're launching this year to offer even more um, in, in intellectual exploration, curiosity and the life of ideas for everybody in our community. And I'd like to offer particular thanks among many um, to Anya McGarvey, who's done so much um, to make this evening possible. The title of this series, Enlightening Minds, is of course a reference to one of the three elements in our crest. Sancte with holiness, sapiente with wisdom, and our lion, mind, spirit, heart. Those three elements reference the importance that we attach to every aspect of the education of our pupils, and they also are three elements which are shared with King's College London, with whom we share our foundation. As you may know, we were founded in 1829 um, as part of King's College London. We originally shared a site with them on the Strand before moving to this much more greener location. And I'm therefore delighted to share that we're working really closely with KCL on this series uh, and, and um, intellectuals from KCL will be joining us um, to offer some, some later lectures in this series. Today we are absolutely thrilled um, to have Mark Melford with us to speak to us on a topic which is, is very dear to our hearts and I'd like to welcome Matthew who's going to say more by way of introduction. Welcome everyone. Beyond the headlines, which tend to focus on climate change's effects or symptoms, there's an untold story of the steady battle to tackle its causes. This largely overlooked story is one of scientific progress and ingenuity, of remarkable breakthroughs and epic feats of engineering. It is the story of the remaking of our economy during our lifetimes and of a path, a very real path, to net zero. Mr. Mark Melford will examine the fascinating innovations through which sectors from transport to farming are reducing emissions even today. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Anya. And good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, first Enlightening Minds lecture. Um, if you have found yourself concerned about the climate crisis, alarmed by what you've seen in the news, uh, especially if there are any of the students among us, I think there are, what you may have seen on TikTok, then this talk is intended for you. Um, the climate crisis is the great story of our age, but there is more than one narrative to it, uh, more than one side to the story. And I'd like to share this evening uh, a perspective, a personal perspective, on a side of the story that gets less news coverage than the weather, but which is actually, I think, much more interesting. Um, it's a story of hard analysis, scientific advances, incredible feats of engineering, ultimately politics, yes, and markets. Um, uh, but it's, above all, a story of hope, actually, and our own agency. It's the story of what we can do about the climate crisis. I'm Mark Melford. Uh, I run the boutique consulting firm CSL. Um, I have been a tech startup founder um, and I'm an engineer by training. Um, I don't want to claim to be, I wouldn't want you to mistake me for an expert in climate change or at least not climate science, but rather through my work over 20 years with tech companies many in this space, and also with governments, where I'm a former policy advisor. I have a point of view on this, and I've written about it and spoken about it. Um, uh, initially at my daughter's school, actually, Wimbledon High, where I went in to speak to some of the year eight girls more than a year ago, and which ultimately led to Anne inviting me to give this lecture. Um, and I'd like to maybe credit my daughter for inspiring this because it came out of the evident anxiety 
that young people in particular are clearly feeling about the climate crisis. Um, and certainly if you absorb that from the news, you know, it's understandable. I think the side of the story about what we can do about it receives much less attention. Um, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. Um, climate change can feel overwhelming like the house in this picture. Um, but there are different narratives. Michael Hume, the professor of human geography at Cambridge University, who stood in this room a year ago, posit posited 11 narratives of climate change, ranging from climate change as a crisis through to climate change as a story of scientific progress. And that's much more what I'd like to uh, focus on today. Um, I am here to, I hope, offer some good news and some heartening anecdotes and uh, examples of what is being done. Not it, to be complacent. I'm not saying don't be concerned. Do be concerned, because this is important stuff. Um, but rather like the house in this story, the, the house is not the problem. It is the symptom. And the flood here is the symptom of climate change. To really tackle things, we need to get to the root cause of what is going on. And the fact is, there is a lot we can do and are already doing. Technologies are developing and which are developed, which will take us to net zero. We can actually already do all we need with the technology available today, and there will be more breakthroughs. So, this is not a geography talk. It's not even really a science talk. Um, though it is STEMI, it's sciencey and engineeringy. It features graphic and detailed depictions of charts and numbers, which some viewers may find disturbing, confusing, boring even maybe. But it comes in seven chapters, uh, which I will dash through. Are we ready? Let's go then. Chapter one is the plan, the overall approach and the mindset, which I'd like to just dwell on um, as a way of thinking about climate change. Two, generating power. Then decarbonizing everything, our lives, industries, and the things that we do. Four, a little intermission. I want to tell you a story about methane. Five, the supergrid. All will become clear. Six, and this is uh, hot off the press, Carbon reduction and negative emissions, a fast-moving and very new topic. And finally, the path to net zero. Okay, a lot to cover, so let's go. Right. Oh, as all, I should just mention that as all presenters, I'm sure of the uh, uh, entertainingness of their own material, I have a couple of visual aids. Um, I shall be handing out prizes to people that give good answers to difficult questions that I may throw to the audience. Do we have any geography students in tonight? Ah, uh, ooh, good, excellent, right. So you'll have a chance to show off some of your geography knowledge. Um, I also have one little visual aid, which I think I may do now, actually, to get it out of the way. Uh, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is 417 parts per million. Is that a lot? Does anyone know what, how much that is or how it feels? So that is actually equivalent to one drop, one drop in a litre of water. So what I thought I would do, I hope this works, is attempt to put a single drop there into a litre of water. So as far as the sun is concerned, our atmosphere looks slightly less transparent, at least to ultraviolet lights, than it would do where it, well, where carbon dioxide at the levels, I think you can probably see already, that's making quite a, a difference. So 417 parts per million, where's my dofa? I'll go back and get it. It's the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that's really, ultimately, what we are talking about. Right, your first chance for a prize. Can anyone identify this molecule? Right, yes, you, sir, on the end. Uh, that's CO2. That is a CO2. 
There we go. You win a prize. <laughs> Audience participation. CO2. Right, carbon dioxide. And more specifically, the 39.5 gigatons of it that we emit into the atmosphere every year. How about this one? Oh, now we're getting going. You say right here. It's obviously me. Oh! I'm going to need a new doofer. All right, a methane. Yes, and there we emit... So the maths is uh, tricky. The equivalent of about 31 more gigatons of CO2 a year, depending on how you do the maths. Sorry, I don't mean to do you out of your prize. You'll get another chance to uh, answer a question later. Don't worry. Um, so really, it's, uh, so methane is molecule for molecule more warming than carbon dioxide, as you, many people may know but it breaks down in the atmosphere relatively quickly, within 10 years. So actually, in thinking about tackling the climate crisis, we have two crises going on simultaneously, and they are quite different. In the long run, it's all about the CO2. But in the short run, the next 10 to 20 years or so, there's a very significant problem with methane as well, and we need to tackle them both. Okay, And let's start, and this is the plan, uh, by figuring out exactly where they come from. So, in broad terms, 25% of all emissions are from electricity generation, and a further 24% from agriculture. That's arable farming, uh, it's livestock farming, it's forestry and changes of land use. 21% from industry, all industry, everything we make, all manufacturing, including pharmaceuticals. 14% transport, again, all forms of transport. 6% is buildings, both building them and heating them. And 10% is other. And we can break it down further. If you take those broad categories, and let's have a look in detail. I've broken them down into little subcategories of different types of building, different types of transport, road, shipping, aviation, rail, for example. And let's have a look at the emissions by those categories in gigatons per year of CO2 equivalent. CO2 first, right? Now, straight away, you can see there are some marked differences. So, for example, road transport compared to shipping, aviation, and rail... You might look at this and say, well, look, it's all about road. We hear a lot about flying, and it's true that on an individual level, for any one of us, if we take a flight, that chews up a big portion of our carbon budget. So yes, but globally, it's really all about road. Iron and steel, agriculture and forestry. So that all adds up to that 39.5 I mentioned, gigatons of CO2. Now, methane is very different. Methane is essentially concentrated in three sources only, and they are at the bottom of this page. Waste management is essentially landfill sites. Fuel production we'll speak about later. And agriculture, forestry, land use. This is the problem of burping cows, essentially, enteric emissions from livestock. So methane, unlike CO2, is very concentrated in a small number of industries. So if we can solve a few problems here, in fact, the whole point of showing you this slide is that what we've really done already is break this overwhelming looking problem, like the flood, down into a series of still big, but more manageable problems. Because if we had 12 strategies to, a, for example, tackle road transport, methane in waste management, then we would have gone a long way towards solving the crisis. This, if you like, is the approach. So what's the plan? Well, here's a start in terms of the general strategy to tackle a lot of this. Anyone guess what I'm going to say next? Oh, yes, you, sir, at the back. Electrification, well done. Oh, you might just have earned... I'm going to have to get some more of these. Do you think I can get it all the way to the back? Sorry, health and safety. There we go. Well done. 
Electrification, yes. So, in essence, here's a cunning three-step plan. We electrify the major uses of electricity. So, transport, what do we do? We electrify it. Housing, the heating and the housing, we electrify it. Industry, wherever we can, from cement making to steel making, we electrify it. Cows, we can't electrify, we'll come back to that. So this is the first step of the plan, or actually it's the second step, because prior to that, the power that these consume, we generate that power in a renewable way. And step three, the supergrid, we have to link the power generation to the uses with uh, a smart grid. Now, I want to say a word or two about each of these. And these form the first half of what I'm going to talk about this evening, really. So, that was chapter one. We're already on chapter two. How are we doing? Okay. Chapter two is all about renewable power generation. Uh, some solar and some onshore winds there. Right. So this is the first really interesting analysis I want to share with you, and it's about the cost of generating renewable power. This is Dogger Bank, the biggest offshore wind farm in the world, and it generates 1.2 gigawatts of electricity. It's also set to triple in size and capacity, and when complete, it's going to generate enough power for 6 million homes is a decent chunk of all the homes in the UK. The size of each one of these offshore monopoles is 490 feet tall, which makes each blade the length of a rugby pitch. And the UK and Germany and China generate three quarters of all the world's offshore wind between them. So the UK is leading in this. Right. Now... Let's have a look at the cost of generating some different forms of power. Right, this is a little plot of, in the decade or so since 2010 through to roughly the present day, the cost of generating power in uh, what the industry calls the levelised cost of energy, which is essentially what it costs you to make it rather than sell it. So, anyway, now... A fossil fuel, I've taken coal here as an example, costs about $110 per megawatt hour of electricity. And it has done pretty consistently. This line is flat since 2010. An example, renewable power, onshore wind, started in 2010 at the same level, but has got cheaper. It's now roughly a third. That's onshore wind wind turbines in fields. Offshore wind, which is famously more expensive because you have to do all the same stuff but at sea, there you go, has come down more steeply still and is also now cheaper than uh, my fossil fuel there. And as for solar, don't even get me started, the cost of generating solar power has cratered over the last decade. It's come down by 90%. And so, do we have any economics upper six students in? No? Aha. Well, so what something remarkable happened in about 2019, just as we all went into COVID. It wasn't much talked about, certainly in the press, but it became cheaper to generate a megawatt hour of electricity with renewables than to burn fossil fuels. And this is true with some local exceptions all over the world. These are global figures. And economists call that a tipping point. And moreover, every one of these curves for renewables is sloping down and exhibiting another thing that economists, or maybe it's sociologists, are fond of talking about, a learning curve, right? The idea that whatever you do, whether it's putting up a tent or putting up a 500-foot monopole in the North Sea, the more you do it, the better you get at it, and the cost of doing it comes down. And these things will only continue getting cheaper. Now, I should declare that since preparing this slide, which was about 12 months ago, there has been a 2023 update to it, and a slight wrinkle in my 
clean-sounding thesis that the costs of some of these renewables, offshore wind is a good example, have gone up in 2023 due to a kind of perfect storm of inflationary pressures on the price of steel, um, interest rates in what is a very capital-intensive industry you, I'm sure, are familiar with the prices. So they can go up as well as down, but the long-term trend is, I think you'll, I, I will assert, uh, still very definitely down. So all of that means that today, globally, renewable energy, and these figures are actually solar and wind, um, accounts for 12% of um, all power. Um, actually, here's a question. The 12% is the global figure. The UK is not 12%. Higher or lower? Higher, very good. Yeah, the UK is about 44% in Q3 of 20. The UK generates a lot more of its power renewably than... Um, uh, many countries. So um, another thing to be pleased about uh, uh, being, uh, being it. We can't take too much, all, all the credit for that. There are various reasons for it. But in terms of putting out um, uh, offshore wind in particular, the UK is doing well. In 2030, this is reckoned to be 40%. These figures are, I think, oh yes, from the Energy Transitions Commission. Uh, in fact, the EU has just given a COP28 target of 42.5% by 2030. COP is the, uh, by the way, the conference of the parties, the annual shindig that happens in December each year where all this gets discussed and commitments are made. And by 2050, 75%. There are a range of estimates, actually, beg your pardon. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's try and get that back. There are a range of estimates. I had an error bar on there. Oh, there it is. A range up between 60 and 85% for renewals. So this is a whole-scale transformation in the energy marketplace, if you like, and it is underway now. China installed more solar power last year in calendar 2023 than the US has done in the last three decades. So things are really moving very fast. Now, while wind and solar are by far the most mature of these sectors... There are other forms of renewable power generation where exciting things are happening. Uh, I could talk about geothermal, for example, hydro, but tidal power is another fast-developing renewable sector I thought worth a mention. Um, as technologies go, more at the forefront than the mainstream, but one where the UK is also a world leader. Why? Uh, because we have the best tides, believe it or not. Uh, 11, we have the best, it sounded Trumpian, didn't it? <laughs> we have the best tremendous tides. Everyone says so. <laughs> All these other countries with their failing tides. Um, 11 metres is the tidal range to the north and west of Scotland. Uh, it's about the height of this room, nearly. Uh, seven metres, no, not quite. Yeah. Seven metres on the River Thames, as the rowers will know. But 11 metres is a tidal range matched in the world only at one other location. Anyone like to hazard a guess? Where else apart from the north of Scotland has the highest tidal range in the world? Bay Where? The Bay of Fundy. The Bay of Fundy. That's close, yeah. Nova Scotia. You're too old to qualify for a piece of chocolate there. <laughs> oh, sorry, I know you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, Anyway, 11 metres. We have unmatched uh, tidal range in the UK. So the um, European Marine Energy Centre is based in the Orkney Isles. Um, and here, as the inventor has helpfully sketched out for us on the beach, is one concept. Um, this is British firm uh, Orbital Power. I hope I can make the little clip play. Are you going to play? There we are. Uh, so also involving large propellers, but underwater. In fact, of course, as the engineers will correct me, they're not propellers, but impellers, because they are being driven by the water that flows past them, but because water is 800 times denser than air, it imparts an enormous amount of energy to these blades. 
Um, and this concept, which is one of a number of firms in this space, um, has two pillars, impellers attached to a, a body roughly the size of a passenger aircraft fuselage. And the whole assembly is taken out into the ocean and anchored to the seafloor where, with a huge change, where the tide flows past it, generating power unlike wind power. This is constant. Well, not constant, but it's predictable. The tide is always flowing. Not always. It's slack twice a day, of course, but it is predictable because the tides are driven by the moon. Um, this has the potential to generate up to 11% of all the UK's energy, according to the Marine Energy Centre. Uh, the challenge is very hard engineering. Um, I'm not sure whether it's harder than putting an oil rig in the, uh, the deep North Sea, um, but it's tough to do. It's an unforgiving environment. Okay. So, chapter three. If we've seen that we can generate power renewably. Let's focus a little now on the use of power. And here is a photograph of some power being used, uh, and specifically in the melt shop of a steel plant where iron ore is being melted down in blast furnaces. This is topical today, actually, because an example of what I'm talking about is very much in the news at Port Talbot. Um, so what we need is plans for the steel industry, and in fact, all industries, as I said, for buildings, for industry. I'm going to focus on just two examples. I'll say a little bit about transport, and I'll say a little bit about agriculture, of examples of how we can decarbonize stuff. Transport. Right. Does anyone here own an electric car? One, two, three, I can see a few. Very good. I mean... Actually, the really cool kids would say they own no car. They get around uh, uh, in human power. So there are a billion cars in the world. It's a $3 trillion industry. And half the cost of an electric car is its battery. And I'll tell you a little story. Um, a decade ago, the US Department of Energy set a stretch target for reducing the cost of those batteries because they were pretty expensive. This is the cost of storing a kilowatt hour in a lithium ion battery. And it used to be just under $1,200. So their target was by 2020 to see if the industry could get that down to $200. That's the red line there. Who thinks they made it? Who thinks they didn't make it? Ah, that's right. Uh, very few votes for didn't. And of course, I wouldn't be t highlighting it if they hadn't made it. They made it by 2018, and the price has continued to go down since then. Again, a little blip in 2021. Uh, I don't have a figure for this year, or 2023, but it's forecast to continue down much further. They blew through it a couple of years early, um, and so the price is much lower now. And watch out. Here is my good friend Shell Valoan with the world's first electric lorry. So vans and trucks, so-called commercial vehicles, account for one in seven vehicles on the road, but 30% of all emissions. And this example being assembled in Austria has a medium range for local deliveries. Volvo has also developed a 40-ton, 16-metre truck with a 400-kilometre range, which is all you can drive in a day anyway. So what this means in terms of the forecast numbers of these electric vehicles on the road is that in 2010, there was practically 0.2%, very few. The green is electric here. 2022, 13%, one in seven, as I said. The forecast is for 2025, these figures from The Economist, um, 35%, it seems high, doesn't it? And 2040, 75% of the vehicles on the road electric. Now, it does seem high. I mean, you might challenge that. But consider this. I was amazed when I saw this the other day. Data from our very own, this is UK figures now. Those were global. Um, 
the UK British Department of Transport, these are new car registrations, so not on the road, but sales in the, well, this millennium. And it's a story of petrol, diesel, and electric, essentially. So battery, electric, plug-in hybrid, and regular hybrid. And, you know, petrol sales and diesel sales are going up and down. In the case of diesel, very solidly down. But look at this. Look at what happened during COVID. In 2022, 43% of new car registrations in the UK were electric. Now, in Europe, that figure was 47%, a record-breaking 4.4 million units in Europe. And three, actually, of those best-selling models um, were Chinese. Here's the one that definitely deserves a prize. Anyone know what that is? Anyone drive one of these? BYD? Biggest electric car maker in the world. As of last quarter, they overtook Tesla. This is a Chinese brand, and the Chinese are coming. Xpeng, recognize this? These are the brands. Of, yeah. yeah. The, uh, this is the cover of The Economist this week. You know, the car industry is uh, terrified by uh, the arrival of these uh, very low cost, in many cases, um, car models. It has been forecast that by the mid-2020s, the cost of an electric car will be comparable to that of an internal combustion engine car. I can tell you that the cheapest models available in domestic Chinese markets now are retailing at about $11,000. So whether we're able, ever able to get our hands on them for that price or whether there'll be hefty import tariffs, I suspect there will be, but, you know... Essentially, technologically, this nut has been cracked and cheap electric transport is about to be available for all of us. So, for electric, the electrification of transport, at least road transport, is going well. We can talk afterwards, if you'd like, about rail or air. Let's talk about agriculture. And here it is. Agriculture. I love an overview, me, and this is courtesy of the US Geological Survey, all the agriculture in the world on one, one map is highlighted in green. All the areas of the earth given over to farming, 1.87 billion hectares on one chart. Um, doesn't look like that. So that's, uh, let me see, 35% of the world's land area. It doesn't look like that, does it? That's because this is a Mercator's projection map which Greenland has long complained makes it look fat. And I have another one. There is the uh, Gull Peters projection, which switches the... Uh, it's the same green for agriculture, and now added in, the brown areas are where livestock farming happens. Um, so here's another one for a prize. Can anyone tell me the world's farmingest country? The country with the biggest area of land given over to agriculture. Did someone say Denmark. Um, it would be a surprise. Any advance on Denmark? Come on, geographers. Russia. Very good guess, sir. No. Russia is third with 155 million hectares. Where? You don't eat chocolate. Okay. I'm not going to offer that for your guess of Russia. It's Ukraine is another good guess. It's actually India with a whopping uh, 179 million hectares uh, is the world's most farming country, uh, farmingest country. So I keep my chocolates on that one. So agriculture is vastly significant, and we need to talk about cows. This is a cow. Um, and we're talking about enteric methane emissions. Um, I'll show you an enteric methane emission. Sorry about that, Dr. Cotton. In fact, that was uh, most of the, mostly it's actually burping rather than farting. But one cow can generate 500 litres a day of methane. That's 100 kilograms a year, 
which is more emissions than a car. And there are a billion cows on the planet. So methane from livestock contributes 3.7% of all anthropogenic, that's man-made, greenhouse gas emissions, according to the company Ruminate. Um, it is a very difficult problem, which is why I brought it up as one of the more intractable problems. Uh, if we're going to tackle the methane problem, we have to tackle this. But even here, there is some hope, and technology is beginning to offer at least an approach to dealing with the problem. And now we need to talk about red seaweed, or as we should properly call it, uh, marine algae. Here is some red seaweed being cultivated in a pilot project by the company Sea Forest, um, a 2023 finalist in Prince William's Earthshot Prize competition. Um, and there are others doing something similar. Red seaweed, when processed and dried, is nature's natural anti-methanogenic compound. Because when it's dried into a feedstock for cattle, as here, it's been shown in tests to reduce methanogenic enteric emissions by up to 60%. In fact, more than 60% in some tests. So even here, in this most hard-to-abate sector, that means hard to decarbonise, there is real progress and a path to tackling the emissions. It is important to note that in addition to cows, methane is also given off naturally by peat wetlands and other forms of agriculture, such as rice paddies, actually, and landfill sites. OK, how are we doing? The story of methane, and this is like a little intermission. If, I, if we're OK, I just want to tell you this story because it's one of the most remarkable stories that's come across to my attention in the last year or so on this topic. Here is some methane being emitted, flared from uh, oil refining sites. And you remember, here's our molecule of methane, the 31 gigatons of methane which is emitted every year. So methane, remember, is more warming than CO2, but breaks down quickly. So fast action here would dramatically slow global heating because methane is so short-lived. Now, the UN said last year that a cut of just 45% in methane emissions by 2030 would in and of itself reduce global warming by 0.3 degrees. Um, and it actually looks likely that as of December last year, just a few weeks ago, we're not going to get 45%, we're going to get an 80 to 90% cut. This was promised or pledged by um, a set of the largest oil producing countries and companies at COP28 in Dubai just a few weeks ago. What's going on? So methane emissions are therefore both a grave threat and a golden opportunity. This is the low-hanging fruit of this whole uh, climate crisis tackling because fixing this problem needs no new technology whatsoever, at least as far as it is concerned with fuel emissions, and not even that much investment. Let me explain. Do you remember our chart here? where we saw the methane was concentrated in just three areas. Um, this one is essentially landfill site. This one at the bottom is the cows I was talking about. Uh, well, among other things, but mostly the cows. I'll talk, this is a story about fuel production, OK? Um, and the methane that is emitted here. This is an oil well in Alberta, Canada, and it is emitting methane. Can anyone see it? I can tell you, you can't because methane is famously invisible to the human eye. But under a modified form of infrared, it is visible. And here you can see it escaping at the base of this oil well, essentially just because the oil well is imperfectly maintained. Um, yeah. And so here's a story. This is the Sentinel-5P satellite launched by the European Space Agency as part of their Copernicus program. And um, here it is in a low Earth orbit analysing the atmosphere with, you guessed it, an infrared camera. 
And the amazing thing here, this satellite was, came on stream in 2022 and since then has been scanning the atmosphere and here's the really interesting thing, publishing, live streaming what it sees. Um, it's courtesy of the European Space Agency and a satellite company called Kairos. And this is what it sees. Here is a methane leak escaping from uh, probably an oil well. And you can see roads. This is the human habitation. You can see the buildings here. So this is the important thing here is the, the resolution. It's down to 60 metres uh, and the sensitivity down to 500 kilograms an hour. And that means it can resolve individual wellheads. Here's a few more in an oil field in some desert region. And that means that over the course of its first year doing this, it tracked over a thousand of these so-called super emitter events. And we can see where they are and who's responsible. So first off, actually first off we can pat ourselves a little bit on the back. The North Sea is looking pretty good here. The Americans are a bit naughty. The Russians have been quite naughty. Um, actually, these blue, by the way, these are uh, not to do with oil and gas at all. These are to do with those landfills I mentioned. Uh, and that's a different story we can pick up. These are all in three countries, actually. Um, but here's, this is definitely worth a piece of chocolate. Does anyone know this country? Turkmenistan, sir. <laughs> you earned it. <laughs> it is Turkmenistan. <laughs> Congratulations. There you go. Uh, and there is President uh, Serdar Berhamudahiyev at his inauguration, inauguration ceremony last year. Turkmenistan is the world's most... And apologies for there are any Turkmen in the audience tonight. <laughs> it's not my intention to embarrass... Actually, it is. That's exactly my intention because... Um, there is Turkmenistan at the top of the global league table of naughtiness when it comes to methane. So if you, like me, had one eye on COP28 in December and were wondering how those oil men had found it in themselves to reduce methane emissions by 80 to 90% by 2030, this is why. It's, <laughs> it's a gotcha. It's because of tables like this published in The Guardian and other prominent newspapers. Um, and so it's technology, the internet, satellites, naming and shaming, producing really quite remarkably quick action. Okay. So this brings us back to that little equation I had earlier. We've seen we can generate power renewably. We've seen some ways we can decarbonize stuff. We have to say a word or two about the grid, the super grid. Uh, so this is the problem. The pro of balancing the system, getting power from where it is made to where it is needed, i.e. where the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine, and the problem of getting it from when it is generated to when it is needed, i.e. from the daytime when it's sunny to the nighttime when it's dark and people like to put the kettle on. So the first of those problems is called transmission and distribution. The second is called storage. So how do we do that? We need an entirely new form of grid. And first off, don't worry, it won't look like this. Uh, incidentally, these are this, these traditional British pylons with their A-frame lattice have been around. They were designed in and have been unchanged since 1927, uh, nearly a century ago. No, the, uh, the grid of the future will look like this, with the T-frame pilots. Has anyone seen these? No one? They are about, not many of them, because it takes a long time to get around to putting them up. I, as I think one goes marching across the M5 somewhere near Bristol, but yeah, it takes a long time. Anyway, this is not the point. The point is, the grid of the future needs to carry four times the electricity uh, that the grid does today. And the capacity needs to go from 27,000 terawatts a year to 100,000 terawatts a year. Um, so it's a huge change. And the grid needs to be smarter. What do I mean by that? 
traditionally, essentially, you have a large power station, there are your pylons transmitting it, breaking up locally to a consumer. But the grid of the future will still have the odd power station, but much more distributed generation from wind farms and solar farms, and battery storage, grid-scale battery storage. Then you have your transmission, your local distribution, which, by the way, includes some more generation being fed in from local solar and wind farms. And as you see, no room for the customer. Oh. No, actually, we go around the corner. Here's the customer who himself or herself has got some local generation, charging cars, community electric vehicle schemes, more customers also with more. And it all needs to feed into the grid. So it's much more... But this is a smart grid. It's much more complex. The British grid has enjoyed a century of quiet obscurity, really, really only being asked to do thing, two things. One, keep the lights on, and two, add the minimum you can to our electricity bills. And it's done that quite well. Um, the British grid is even quite green. It adds a third less emissions than the German grid, for example. Um, but this is about to change. The government has pledged... Well, actually... Perhaps more consequentially, the Labour Party has pledged uh, to uh, get to an emission-free grid by 2030. And that, I can tell you, is a Herculean task. It's an almost wartime effort will be needed to do that. The rate of investment will need to multiply by a factor of seven uh, to get there. And I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, what does that battery look like? Um, it looks like this. This is a grid scale storage battery. And this is what it looks like inside. Um, this one is the world's largest, actually, a vanadium redox flow battery commissioned in China last year. It stores 100 megawatts and a storage volume of 400 megawatt hours. Um, but battery technology is a good example of being ripe for a breakthrough. Um, it's um, Lithium-ion batteries, which we mostly use, even in our cars, are actually quite old technology. And there are newer technologies about to, I think, uh, become mainstream. There is actually one King's parent who may be here tonight, is he? Is Tom McCollum in the building? Who has a... Stand up, Tom McCollum. Yes. So Tom has a grid-scale battery storage company. Um, uh, Lena Energy, if I'm pronouncing that right, has a very exciting solid-state sodium battery technology working at grid scale. So find Tom afterwards and hit, uh, learn a bit about that. Suffice to say uh, that private equity funding is flooding into this uh, market um, and growing exponentially. Anyway, so you can't use electricity for everything. No talk on the climate will be complete without mention of hydrogen. And in fact... So, therefore, this talk will be incomplete. I think in the interests of time, I've had to make swinging cuts. Uh, it's time for uh, to move on the pace. I'm conscious of getting you home to your dinners as well. A quick progress check, then. Uh, all this engineering is great, I hear you say, but does it add up to a path to net zero? Well, um, up until 2019, this is a chart from McKinsey, um, emissions were, as you may have heard, rising. And in fact, there was a blip during COVID. In 2023, they hadn't dropped much, but, oh, beg your pardon, let me go back. By most estimates, they will peak about now. It would be interesting to see. This will be an absolutely, uh, what's the word, epochal moment when emissions, if they do, globally begin to fall. Um, and the great political and environmental movement of our age is focused on this blue line and bending it downwards. Um, because I think the top blue line, the one that people are sort of despondent about, is what would happen with today's policies, today's actors, uh, and today's level of urgency, and today's technology. But if everyone, every country that's involved in trying for this achieved all their goals, we would bend it down to the lower of these lines. Um, but the eagle-eyed among you will have spotted that this line 
does not cross the axis at 2050. There is a gap. And there are many versions of this chart. They all have something of a gap there. And this brings us to, I guess, the last sort of topic in Chapter 6. Welcome to the red-hot but controversial topic of carbon removal and negative emissions. Um, now, this is controversial because many here detect a moral hazard. Um, you know, don't speak of removing carbon, says no lesser authority than the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. Measure first, then reduce. Um, critics have even called this a license to pollute. Um, also, some of the technology is kind of associated with the oil industry, but not all. But it's, it's also red hot because of that chart I just showed you. I think it's dawned on people, and really, I, my perspective over the last 12 months, that it's going to be necessary. Without it, there is going to be a gap. Um, it's also, from an engineering point of view, entirely possible. So, at the risk of stepping back to a, an even higher level of overview, everything I've spoken about so far, all the emissions we've been talking about, the environmental scientists refer to as sources up into the atmosphere. But there are also sinks, not kitchen sinks, but sinks that pull carbon out of the atmosphere, specifically the oceans and the green land. And if everything we've been speaking about, this is electricity, food, industry, all those emissions are driving carbon into the atmosphere, sinks are pulling it down. The coastal oceans absorb 17% of what goes into them and land 24%. Um, and then there is a gap which remains in the atmosphere. That's how we're getting to the uh, 417 parts per million I mentioned at the start. So you could reframe this whole challenge as one of, yes, reducing emissions. And thus far, the whole debate has been over here about getting these down. But you might also, if you were comfortable with the moral hazard, work over here as well in seeing what you could do to boost the sinks, the land, the ocean, and even potentially artificially removing carbon from the atmosphere. So, land sinks absorb 24% of all emitted carbon. This is, so projects here are things like preserving grasslands and wetlands, reforestation, afforestation, um, regenerative agriculture, crops that can actually lock carbon up. But, and there is a but here, as far as afforestation goes, these are long-term solutions. They take 50 years to work, essentially, because saplings don't absorb much carbon. Fully grown trees do, but trees can die or catch fire, returning all their absorbed carbon to the atmosphere. So they need care and stewardship over a number of years. Um, there was a lot of talk you know, a few years ago about tree planting. Mark Benioff, the chief executive of Salesforce, had the One Trillion Trees initiative. Um, but it turns out that planting the seeds isn't the clever part, uh, but rather the patient care of nurturing through to maturity. A bit like fatherhood, really, I guess. <laughs> um, so at worst, this can be, you know, uh, you know, this is where greenwashing, people talk of greenwashing, um, although there is much good work being done. Oceans absorb carbon in three ways. The so-called um, solubility pump, it dissolves into the water. The so-called carbonate pump, that marine creatures and corals build carbon through bicarbonates into their shells. And the so-called biological pump, which is kelp and seagrass, which absorbs carbon 35 times faster than rainforests, um, uh, tropical rainforests, that's right. Here's a wonderful example of, uh, this is the Swansea University Seagrass Ocean Rescue Project, reseeding seagrasses around the Pembrokeshire coast and aiming to restore 15% of them by 2030, using volunteers and what funding they have. This is the sort of thing that can be done to boost this natural sink. And there are dozens of fascinating initiatives like this. Which brings me to 
the last and most exotic category of engineering solution to the climate crisis, engineered sinks or carbon removal, sometimes known as direct air capture. This is a fledgling industry, a very small number of players in it so far. In fact, it sometimes seems like only two. A Swiss startup called Climeworks, and this is some of their plants here. They have plants in Iceland and a US oil giant called Occidental Petroleum, or Oxy, whose plant is still being built. And what happens here is that carbon dioxide is sucked directly out of the atmosphere. This is how it works, I hope you can see. So in comes the air. There's a solid cassette with a sorbent material on it, or an amine, which absorbs the CO2 out of the air, and clean CO2-free air goes out of the back. Then the cassette is heated and releases or surrenders its CO2, which is injected underground or sequestered where it is stored safely and permanently and actually mineralizes into rock after a few years. So this can be done anywhere as long as you have some rock to put it in. It's often, this is direct air capture. It's sometimes confu it's often confused with its cousin, carbon capture and storage. Uh, the here, you already have a factory. You have a plant emitting you know, flue gas, and you stick a similar amount of uh, chicanery to absorb the carbon out of that flue gas, and then you inject it underground. The difference is that this gas was full of the stuff to start with, whereas this gas being fresh air was only 400 parts per million. So it's very hard to suck that out. It's at a very low concentration. Okay. This is carbon neutral. This is carbon negative, right? This is actually reduced. And that's why this is the, this is the one that is causing so much interest. Um, yeah. Uh, in fact, it's hard to overstate the, uh, the uh, impulse, if you like, to this particular industry over the next few years. Okay, we're now coming towards the end of the story and have arrived at the very frontier of climate technology. I have a little story here about a technique called enhanced rock weathering, which I think I will skip because I'm conscious that I'm probably overrunning badly. Will we get there? Yes, we will get there. We will definitely get there. <laughs> But will it be fast enough? And that brings me to the last chapter, the path to net zero. Okay. So, will it be fast enough? Well, there are many players involved in this, and here we need to move beyond technology to talk a bit about the motive forces for action, the drivers, the uh, markets, and prices. Um, so I've spoken so far mostly about energy producers and energy users. Whoopsie daisy. I've spoken about the engineers and scientists who are making the breakthroughs. I'll say a word about activists who have a vital role to play in raising public awareness and in moral suasion and keeping the pressure up on all the other actors. We as consumers in the choices we make also have a significant role to play, and we can talk about that afterwards. I'll just say a word, though, about finance and the financial markets, because they are kind of fundamental in all this. It's often said that finance has been guilty of doing an efficient job based on flawed metrics. Um, it directs, essentially, capital and therefore effort, but based on prices, and it equates price to value. So things which do not have a price can get ignored as if they had no value. Things like biodiversity, carbon in the atmosphere, habitat destruction. And so it's long been said we need a price for carbon. And for many years, and for many good reasons, governments have been a bit hesitant to establish one. But this too, even in this last area I'll talk about, this too is potentially changing just in the last two years. So. Last up, the price of carbon. Anyone got a guess? What's the cost of emitting a 
ton of carbon. Anyone like to hazard a guess? Anyone know? 50 euros, did I hear? 60? 100, what? 60 as of today, 100 euros. 60, good, good answer. So, look, we'll come, to, we'll come to this. Economists have an answer. Uh, the, the view of the social cost of emitting a tonne of carbon, and it's in that range of 170 to 190 uh, dollars a tonne. Now, governments have begun to tax it, not all governments, and certainly not at that level. But there, and there's a huge range, actually, from about the highest I can find is Sweden and Switzerland are up at about $130 a tonne. Places like Ukraine, it's less than a, a dollar a tonne. Now, the interesting thing here is the emergence, or should I say the coming of age, of carbon emissions trading schemes or systems. The biggest in the world is the European trading system, which is not new. It's been bimbling along for you know, many years. But the key thing is that the price of carbon has been low, way too low to have much effect. And this too started to change in 2020, when the price started to climb. It reached $107 in about October last year, and has dropped down, as my learned colleague said, to about well, $68 a tonne when I, I think I looked, put this in on Tuesday. So it goes up and down. But the, the trend is upwards, and the forecasts for it, most commentators think that it will hit $150 to $200 a tonne. And this is, oops, sorry, this is interesting because, oh, dun, dun. up at this level, those hardest to abate industries can really start, well, they will start to be forced to change quicker. So, is this having any effect? One example, two examples. The cement industry and uh, we have a very distinguished cement analyst with us, Yuri Serov, in the front row here, who correctly uses the cost, uh, cost of carbon. So the world's leading cement makers are notable for having been slow in this respect. Cement is a very difficult industry to decarbonise for technical reasons. But also, they haven't really produced as good a plan as, for example, the steelmaking industry. And it looks as if the markets are beginning to punish the cement industry for this. Come on, come back. This is just a chart. It doesn't matter what it's of. It's the price-earnings ratio of the world's leading cement companies between 2012 and 2018, where the PE ratio was 15. But at exactly the time the price of carbon started going up there, you can see that this PE ratio has dropped. So it looks as if investors themselves are penalising companies that don't have a strong carbon reduction story. And clean energy investment is exploding. This is investment in fossil fuels five years ago, 2022, 2023, in the line, $900 billion globally, whereas investment in clean energy, $500 uh, billion, I beg your pardon, five years ago, 2022, 1,200, last year, 1,800 um, billion dollars globally. Mark Carney, the UN envoy on climate change and finance and erstwhile central banker, said it is going through the roof. It has unstoppable momentum. So this is big. And while the hour is late and the need is dire, something seismic is happening, something monstrous. Um, talking of monstrous, this is a clip of a Krupp Bagger 288 in the Ruhr Valley doing its thing, open cast coal mining in 1978. Um, but this exemplifies, I picked this, because it exemplifies the old economy, the extractive economy, if you like, which had a certain linearity to it. Every year we would extract 800 million tonnes of coal per annum 365 billion barrels of oil, and we would burn it in our cars, in our homes, in our planes, and out into the atmosphere would go, as we saw, 39 billion uh, gigatons of CO2. The renewable economy is circular. We still extract, 
about a million to two million tons of lithium, for example, but much less. We make batteries with it and monopoles for offshore wind turbines, use them, recondition them, as they do need reconditioning, but then we can reuse them. And everything we extracted, it's still there. It can be used the next year. This is the circular economy, and this is the third great energy transition of the modern age. If I may very briefly take a 4,000-year overview of human development, as surely as the Stone Age and the Bronze Age gave way to the Industrial Revolution and the Coal Age, so we're now on the third great transition. As the Industrial Revolution took off, the transition until coal became the dominant form of energy took 50 years. In the 20th century, which one might, future historians may call the oil age, the transition from coal to oil took 30 years. And now we are well underway with the transition to the circular economy or the renewable age. And we have 26 years to go until 2050. So how big is the challenge? Well, it'll cost us three trillion per annum, according to a BCG report. Um, I've actually heard higher figures. Is that a lot? It's quite a lot. Although, to put it in perspective, the profits of the oil and gas industry in 2022 were $4 trillion. Gross global domestic product globally, does anyone want to hazard a guess at how big that is? It's about 100 trillion, so 3 trillion is 3% of global GDP. That's what it will cost us to do the investment for this transition year on year, at least until 2030. Is that a lot? It's quite a lot. I don't know how many, uh, there's not that many uh, Western economies growing at that rate at the moment, so it is a Prime Minister frightener. On the other hand, you know, we've, in very recent history, lived through worse. The, co the COVID pandemic is reckoned to have dented global GDP by 3.4%. America spent 4% of its GDP on the space race for a decade in the 60s. So we've been through this before, things of this scale. All of this led the president of the IEA uh, the International Energy Agency, to remark in September last year, the path to 1.5 has narrowed, but clean energy growth is keeping it open. And despite the scale of the challenges, I feel more optimistic now than I did two years ago. And that sounds like the right tone to me. There are no guarantees, and this will be neither certain nor easy, and certainly not cheap. But there is a pathway. And to wrap up, We've seen that every single technology we need to reach net zero exists today, and more breakthroughs are coming. We've seen that the costs of generating renewable energy have already dropped beyond a tipping point. We've seen that the costs of emitting carbon are finally rising, possibly towards a tipping point of their own. And that means that beyond whatever governments do, private investment and the markets are starting to drive the energy transition. And we've seen that it all adds up to a great turning of the page, a new epoch, the renewable age, as we leave the extractive economy behind. So, my closing message. I'm not saying don't be concerned. Do be concerned. But don't worry, or if you must worry, worry about the biggest challenges on this pathway burping cows, or even Turkmenistan. And above all, don't despair. We're not powerless in this, and you are not. It's all in our hands, in your hands. There's much to do and much you can do. To name but a few things, eat a little less chicken. A little more chicken, I should say, and a little less beef. Learn about marine biology so you can help restore seagrass forests. Learn power engineering so you can help spend some of Keir Starmer's money and deliver the supergrid we need in record time. Uh, learn to climb, so you can fix, or better yet, install 400-foot wind turbines in the North Sea. Or join me. I'm off to start a carbon 
Capture Direct Air Capture Company. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Melford. From China's EV onslaught to feeding cows red seaweed, it's clear we have a lot to be thankful for and optimistic. Um, I'm going to start us off with our Q&A. Um, I'm going to kick us off with a question that might be quite poignant for anyone here in the room, which is that whenever anyone is trying to make climate progress, one of the biggest problems they inevitably face is bureaucracy. How would you say that should be managed, either here, even at a school level, or at a national government level? Okay, so the question was managing government bureaucracy or bureaucracy in all its forms. Um, it, it's clearly different sector by sector. The, the, the area that I would highlight is actually to do with power gen uh, the grid. The grid is the area which is the most held up by bureaucracy. There are, there are solar farms, and in fact there's one wind project I can think of in... Scotland, which is waiting to be connected, and it's been given a date that's nudging 10 years in the future. So the system of permitting to get uh, power projects connected to the grid is, is one of the biggest challenges. And it's not just in the UK. This is even more true in Germany, for example. So that's a good example of an area where bureaucracy is right on the critical path. Um, yeah, and you know, needs to be looked at. I would also like to ask, in your experience, to what extent do you think political activism and awareness has on corporate decisions and policy changes? Um, yeah, I think it's a personal view, but I think uh, activism has been material in creating this climate of kind of moral imperative, which you can see filtering through I gave that example of where the markets were punishing a poor performing company. I mean, that may be for financial reasons, but I think there's also an unacceptability now in not taking this seriously. Um, the president of the IEA I quoted at the end there, that splendidly named Fatih Birol, um, was saying the other day that if you're an oil company and you don't take this seriously, or rather, if you're an oil company and you publish a strategy to increase production, then that's fine. But don't say that you're on board with 1.5 or net zero. You can't have it both ways. And it's, that's a very awkward place for a senior executive to be these days. It's become harder for them to say, this is not true, this is, doesn't apply to me. And that, I think, has a lot to do with the moral suasion that activists, whether it's Extinction Rebellion, Rebellion, Stop Oil, Greta, they all have a vital role to play. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to open it up to the floor for any questions. And again, if you're tuning in online, do use the hashtag KCS Enlightening Minds to post your questions. Do you have any questions? Okay. Just a quick one about um, land, sink, ocean, sink, a pair of slides. There's the sink idea, and 24% land sink, 14% ocean sink. Are there any other sinks to make up to? Is, do we get to 100%? I don't quite know what 14 plus 24, where that ends up. And after that, what about soil in terms of sinks? Yeah, are there any other sinks? Um, now, in a sense, that set is, what's the word, comprehensive. It's land, sea, and other. i put this on the screen again. So it's either being absorbed. Yeah, here we go. If it ain't, if it ain't going into the, uh, the biosphere, the land, or the oceans, then it's in the atmosphere. And that's uh, tackling this gap. That's the role of direct air capture, potentially, the last thing I talked about, sucking it out of the air. But if you don't do that, it's staying there. Um, you, can't, you can't increase 24% land, land sink. Uh, 
Yes. Oh, you can. Yes. That's so. Well, I, maybe I will. The, the, the whole strategy on this side of the page is to increase these as best you can, both of them, and then see what you can do about the remainder. But increasing that 24% of the, uh, that it goes into the land sink, that's the role of afforestation, reforestation, regenerative agriculture products. Um, yeah. There's a few technologies which can kind of play in this field, like biochar, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, you can heat up biomass in the absence of oxygen, pyrolysis, and uh, it locks away carbon as it does so, and you can spread that into the land. It actually acts as quite a good soil, what's the word? It's not a fertiliser, but it improves the quality of the soil. There's also an invariant of enhanced rock weathering I didn't have time to talk to you about it. I'd love to, but essentially you can, it turns out you can grind up quite a wide range of limestones and basaltic rocks and literally spread them on the fields where they will weather. It's called enhanced weathering because being ground up very small, it happens orders of magnitude faster than natural weathering. Rocks are being dissolved by seawater the, the whole time. It just takes thousands of years. But ground up into sand, they can, they can start weathering quite quickly. And there's also evidence that spreading them in, on fields can reduce the need for fertiliser and increase you know, um, carbon capture. Um, there are some wrinkles, of course, because as well as capturing carbon, they may deposit heavy metals in the field that also tend to be bound up with volcanic rocks. But, so there's a, yeah, it's a whole very fertile field, this boosting the land use. Um, and I can, there's actually one good resource I should have mentioned, which I can tell you about afterwards. The Drawdown Project is full of good ideas for um, every single one of these segments here. Any more questions? Yes, you, you, <coughs> you totally failed to mention nuclear power. Why was that? Time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've totally failed to mention so many things. I apologise. I mean, literally... Nuclear, so nuclear in all of this, yes, it, it's going to be an important part of the energy mix in the future. It, it has been in the past. You could say that the UK has, you know, successive governments have neglected it a bit and they're now belatedly, it will play a bigger role. Um, it is a green technology, yes, because you know, it is. And so, you know, countries like France have done very well and have a higher proportion of nuclear power. The fact is that it takes 10 years to build one. So it's going to be part of the mix. I believe that you know, the government is changing tack even at, in the twilight of its administration. But I'm not in any way suggesting nuclear power is not part of the answer. I think it is part of the answer. I just didn't have time to give it the full treatment. Not that you didn't, mean, what about fusion? We didn't even get onto fusion. I mean, that's, uh, that's a whole other thing. I keep wanting to laser people. I should put this down. Thank you. Um, to what extent do you think, in the long run, are these global solutions to the climate crisis reliant on quite sort of profound socio-economic progress in developing countries? Uh, to what extent are the solutions reliant on socio-economic progress in developing countries? Can you explain what you mean? So as in, um, it's all very well, you know, in the West, us trying these... Um, you know, quite complicated, scientific, expensive solutions. But, um, you know, do we need, as a sort of indirect measure, uh, you know, economic development in the sort of wider world, outside of the West? Yes. Um, yeah, this is the problem of sort of fairness and whether we can... Yeah, I mean, is, yeah, here's a nice chart of the unfairness problem that in what's sometimes called the developing world, they did not, they contributed least to the problem. This is cumulative admissions historically. This is a BCG plot. And you know, the worst offenders, you know, we're right up here. We did this, and the US. As this chart, because it's uh, emissions per capita, it flatters China. China is a big, China's put a lot of the stuff in here, and these countries. So, what no, we have very little, if, you, if your question is about moral standing, we have very little moral position to tell 
anyone in Niger or Mali or Sudan what they can do. As you may know, there's been a lot of discussion during the COP process about a reparation fund, and that is a whole parallel. And in fact, there was, you know, as you may know, the progress was made on that in COP28 at Dubai last month. Um, it's also true that while there are many countries affected by this, if you just got China and India right, you would have actually you would have solved 60% of the problem. They are so much bigger than all the others. That, um, and it's also true, I just thought, that you know, it's often the case that developing countries can leapfrog a technology. Mobile phones in Africa is the classic example. So I don't think we have any... We're not in a position to lecture them about how they go about development, but we... I would put it the other way around. It is our... It's the UK's moral obligation to lead in this field, to lead in the development of, and spreading of these technologies. And that's the way I'd, I'd put it. It's, very, it's a tricky problem, though. Yeah, good question. I think we've got time for a few more questions. Um, you sort of spoke before about um, hydrogen and electric cars sort of being the way to move forward. Um, what sort of drawbacks do you think there are, such as, you know, going electric, you need to extract minerals such as lithium, and there's mining, releasing CO2, things like that. To what extent do you think the drawbacks outweigh the benefits, and how much would you agree with the, the fact that going 100% electric is the way to go, maybe? Um, <clears throat> to what extent would I say that Electric is a sort of unalloyed good. Um, I mean, there are concerns about the supply chain of the lithium and the cobalt in particular that goes into electric uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, and there are some concerns about its recycl recyclability and recycling. Those, I think, will get louder in a few years' time as we get a higher volume of batteries that need recycling. I think my position would be that those are real problems, but kind of transitional problems, that they will be solved. In terms of the supply chain for lithium and cobalt in particular, there is plenty in the world. There are new deposits. So on a five to ten year time scale, it's actually not a problem. At the moment, a lot of it's in China, uh, and in, a lot of it's processed in China as well as mined. Uh, cobalt, is, there are concerns in the Democratic Republic of Congo about the way cobalt is being dug up. But as Dr. McCollum in front of you will tell you, we ain't going to be using lithium ion forever. In fact, we may, you know, this may be a technology that is quite rapidly supplanted. Tom's company has a, thing, a sodium solid state technology, and one of the benefits of that is that it uses less of these slightly awkward supply chain minerals. Um, so I think the Problems can be solved. It's not an unalloyed good, but I think it's better than the alternative, personally, which is internal combustion engines, which um, cause the problems that we have seen. Yes. Yes. The, uh, the question is about lithium-ion batteries blowing up. I agree. I mean, I've been quite polite about the technology. It's, um, it's ripe for replacement. I think uh, Dr. Tom will be ruder about lithium-ion. <laughs> this is a technology, I think they run at, what, 40 degrees centigrade? They, they run hot, and the electrolyte is, like, inflammable. It's a crazy technology, actually. So no wonder they catch fire from time to time. It's actually remarkable they don't catch fire more often. So, yeah. But you know, by and large, they are reliable in the phones that we use, although your phones can get hot sometimes. There are much better technologies on the way. Uh, I think we're going to just wrap it up there. Thank you so much. Can we please give Mr. Melford another round of applause? Thank you.